the afternoons are the easiest for me, but I'm happy to, uh, to come to campus uh, most Fridays if that helps so that people want to meet to talk about papers. So today we are starting on the second meme in the course, um, which is connecting. And I'm going to try and be pretty transparent about where we're going. I've already left a number of hints. Um, but I've decided to do something um, as a result of a conversation after class last week. And I'll point out the slide that was really about that conversation, uh, but it was all about the relationship between the gamer and the game, and how are there ways of determining what, who really should have a claim, or are there any quantifiable ways of justifying status for modders or for the, the video game. So, um, Greg Lestelka takes us and his work takes us a certain uh, part of the way there and I, I, the, there were a number of slides last week dedicated to that. Um, today, I actually have decided um, to take a position really clearly as if I, I didn't before. Um, so, today's talk is about creators, consumers, and users. And the obvious question is, are they really the same? Should they be treated the same in law? And to introduce you to a symmetry or asymmetry, depending on how you want to interpret it, that I've been alluding to for a while. And if you look at it, you will see that creation, the meme of the first part of the course, has, was largely about copyright law and associated with copyright law. Second part of the course is about connection. And interestingly, it seems to line up with contract law pretty directly. And the next 10 minutes, um, we're going to go down a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, and this is actually totally new stuff, so I hope it's useful. Seemed like a good idea to AI. Um, so this is a piece that I was reading yesterday. I was very disappointed to not find it online. It's, uh, it's in one of those free um, periodicals. I guess I would call them, um, called Exclaim, which seems to be kind of a music um, periodical, a, a monthly uh, set of reviews, and just a lot of music stuff in there. And it's an article called Gaming's Destiny Will Never Be Mainstream. And it's about the game Destiny. And since we're, call, we're talking about users and consumers um, thought this would be interesting. Um, we haven't talked a lot about stats. So Guardians of the Galaxy, which was the big movie this summer, had an opening weekend of 161 million. Destiny, which is currently the big console game, had an opening five days of 325 million. 
And the article is really interesting because it kind of talks about what's mainstream. And Guardians of the Galaxy is very mainstream, yet Destiny won't be. And you have to look a little bit deeper. And the current generation of consoles roughly is about 23 million. Now this is, you know, this is the PS4 and the Xbox One. The previous generation of consoles, uh, which I think of as Gen 3, um, was only 267 million installed base. Which is, you know, depending on how you want to look at it, but 267 million worldwide is not that gigantic a number for a console generation that went, what, six years, seven years? It was a long generation. Um, and, sorry, typo. That's 1.2 billion, not exclamation point two billion. I'll fix that later. Um, 1.2 billion gamers and roughly, what, 285 million console gamers. Now you have to add in PC gamers, but I don't think they're a huge universe. There are a lot of people on PC, but how many PC gamers are there? Um, so I don't have that statistic. And you can extrapolate backwards from the 1.2 billion and see how much of that is on mobile devices. And that's a really big point. So now we really are talking about consumers. And where this hit me very clearly, especially in the past week and a half, is that Kim Kardashian, or actually her game, keeps calling me through my <laughs> iPad, uh, saying, come, please play my game, because my 12-year-old daughter has become a very serious, not so serious gamer and is very much into uh, the Kim Kardashian game, which uh, I know to some people is a travesty. And I can say as a parent, it's troubling at the very least. <laughs> so I said, I was going to be transparent and not obtuse because we're going to do some really obtuse stuff in a minute. Um, if copyright law is works towards a unity and equality of some sort between creators, consumers, and users, modders, then Contracts are ripping that apart, just shredding it. And that's really what we're going to talk about the next three weeks. So if the law, I'm reluctant to call it the common law of copyright because it's statutory, but it's derived from international law. Um, so it, it, it seems to have kind of a, a more legal e framework uh, than, than just some narrow statute. Um, if copyright law is struggling to deal with the digital age, contract law has determined, not contract law, contracts <coughs> have determined Who's the one percent and who's the ninety-nine percent? And we'll do a lot of detail looking at contracts in the next two weeks. Today is more of a canvas of issues. But let's begin where we left off. So the bait and switch here was right to mod, right to create, but. 
what we really were talking about was personal interactivity in a creative environment and personal creativity in an interactive environment. And I, I do love the symmetries. And there's more of them to come. So the question that I'll ask for the first time, but that was really implied all along, is does copyright really make sense or make more sense in a non-interactive environment? And you should hold that question in your mind. And we eventually made our way to moral rights as a concept introduced just last week and in a, in a real way. And does it provide a bit of a useful step forward in legal terms, in terms of looking at this stuff? So more word games, but hopefully this, this is useful. And I notice the alignments. There's an arrow because I reversed video and game. But you can see, you know, data to documents, game, video, idea, expression, private, public, interactive environment, magic circle, intellectual property. On your right hand side, that symmetry lines up towards not being intellectual property. And on the other side, lines up as being intellectual property. I think the best one, the best two sets of words there for where we're going are interactive environment and magic circle. And Start thinking about structure versus unstructured. Think about playing within a structure. Think about any game, any video game. What is play and what is the environment? Line up the environment with intellectual property and it seems quite comfortable. Line of play with intellectual property, very uncomfortable. So, what does the list really mean? I said it, but more explicitly. So there's a dialectic. Or at least that's what it appears to be. Nature and nurture, idea and expression, creativity and connection, user and system, gamer and game, magic circle, human, societal. Now we're going down the rabbit hole. Non-IP, IP. So what? This is where I was going to end. You're law students. You're brilliant. I can't figure this out. Please figure it out. Carry it. Write a paper on it. <laughs> Somewhere late, late last night, I startled myself and I said, I'm not going to stop here. I really do have a view on this. And I, I think there's something. Um, Derek Parfit is essentially acknowledged as the greatest living moral philosopher, philosopher of ethics. He's at Oxford. Um, I'll let you read this uh, in your own time. 
and, and, and research it, but what he gets to in an entirely logical and non-religious way is the concept of transcendence through connection. Utterly not religious. Does it purely through philosophical inquiry and moral inquiry. Got me thinking. You've seen this, a version of this slide before. What's the secret of Minecraft? It's a generative network system laced throughout with secrets. It somehow seems familiar to me. That's why I didn't stop. Secrets. Magic circle. Magic. Human societal. We can understand societal structures. We still don't have a real good handle on the human. Create oh, creativity and connection. So another slide you've seen before, but in this context. How virtual gaming worlds are revealing the nature of human hierarchies. So games and video games specifically as a way of illuminating stuff about ourselves that we don't know. And I think I mentioned, and, and this is why I didn't stop. I think I mentioned earlier in the class, a couple of weeks ago, sort of playing shooters and playing Destiny and n not knowing who I was. And it's just this very strange feeling. And so all of this started making sense to me. We go back to Boyden. I have stripped Boyden here of any copyright talk. I have turned Boyden into a philosopher. These are his words. I've just sort of parsed out any real mention of, uh, of copyright. And I'm not saying they sound exactly like perfect, but there's an alignment here. Particularly systems or shells into which users pour meaning. Okay. This is going to be the end of the rabbit hole. But it's a deep one. I mean a deep hole. <laughs> I dug a deep hole for myself and perhaps for you. So this is where I end up. And I have not gone to the, very, to the various Luddick journals to see. There's probably a whole bunch of articles. And if there are, I'll bring them next week by noted academics around video games as post-structuralism. I don't know of any. I came to this on my own, not because I read anybody else's stuff, but it wouldn't surprise me because there's great work out there. That so, This seems so obvious. So uh, Jacques Derrida, who's a French philosopher, um, is said to essentially be uh, the father of post-structuralism, and there's a link to uh, the piece that started post-structuralism. He's actually in a seminar on structuralism, um, and he criticized structuralism, and he did it in a piece called Structure, Sign, and Play in the Discourse of Human Sciences. I read it last week because it had the word play in it and decided that it was both too dense and just impossible for me to understand. And so I wasn't going to include it, and I actually discarded it because it was just too tough. But I did read it, and you know, looking for quotes, 
Um, I went back to it last night and also looked at various interpretations of post-structuralism. And what this really ends up being about is post-structuralism is a way of interpreting the world in relation to other pieces. And Dorita's criticism of it, these are my words, are that it anchors around the center. The structuralists, even if they don't think they're, uh, they're, they're creating a center of gravity for their arguments, they are. And there's not enough play in how the structuralists philosophers operate. That's this is it. I went to my hmm, it's about nine inch high now, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, set of PlayStation 4 games. And essentially, I pulled words off of the back covers. Massively multiplayer, open world playground, content creation tools, cooperative mode, public gameplay mode, remote play, dynamic gameplay engine, world editor, scenery and character generators, artificial intelligence. All strike me, and I hope there's some philosophy students among you, as post-structuralist concepts. So, one way of interpreting games is as a post-structuralist means of play. If you interpret it that way, then, then copyright law is structuralist, and contracts done by one party, essentially, are superstructural. And the point is all about the disconnection between what the law is doing and what the video games are doing. And when you look at this list, it's a pretty big gulf. And <coughs> if you go way back, these lists start making sense. And if you say, no, no, but we have a computer scientist here and we have to be respectful. Data is structuralist. It's just ones and zeros. It strikes me as anarchy. Everything is based on ones and zeros. That's that's a, that's a very free, that's a very play-oriented concept. So, we're returning to planet Earth now. The alternative is Fishman. You remember this from last week, creating around copyright. Copyright is good because it creates obstacles to creativity, and obstacles to creativity results in better creativity. Doesn't get more structuralist than that. And more misaligned with games and video games than that. So now we actually get 
to the part that was inspired by the conversation at the end of the class last week. So if you're going to insist on rationality, um, does everybody know what's pictured here? Does anybody know and would anybody care to explain who or what GLaDOS is? Very rational. Yeah. And what does the rationality end up trying to do? <laughs> Killing everybody. Yeah. As, as things in video games. Yes. Rationality and ending up in the most irrational possible place. <clears throat> you know, HAL 9000 from 2001 taken to a, a particularly modern interpretation. Oh yeah, what if HAL 9000 hadn't have been shut down? So if you want to be rational and you want to talk about mods and creativity and users' rights in a legal context, what happens if you measure Creative content by effort. Pure philosophical like effort, number of hours spent, number of pixels pushed, lines of code written or added to. You know, pick your seemingly objective structuralist measure. What is the measure of? It's measuring framing experiences in a video game. Okay. It's the best I could do. And look at things like EVE Online, look at Minecraft. Compare the amount of time that the developers spend building the games and the amount of time or effort or pixels or code that the community, whether modding, playing, or otherwise, or any one of those, spends on the game. And then, since I love Grand Prix Legends so much, um, I mean, it was a very incomplete game. Um, not built by a very large group of people. This is something called the GPL Alternative Track Database. It lists all of the tracks that have been built by the community and gives you download links to them. And the best I could do on the screen capture was get about a third of the list. There's over 500 tracks. Now we're not talking about cars, we're not talking about other things that have been done for the game. We were not talking about building multiplayer when multiplayer didn't work. We were not talking about any of that stuff. Just sheer tracks. A lot more effort and time on this side of the ledger than was spent on that side. Now, there's a contrary argument, and that's the creator argument. But somebody create, came up with the idea and created this, and you shouldn't compare apples and oranges. To which, I'm going to take you back to structuralist versus post structuralist. And say, well, you're going to have to pick your poison here. We're either one world. In which, our, in which our individual identities don't matter as much. <coughs> Parfit, Derrida, Boyden, although he's still around, he may not, he may not want to be put in, in that company, or he may be honored to be put in that company. Um, or 
copyright law and beyond that, contract law. Just an article if you want to know more about mods. And this is a, an old piece. Um, so this is uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson on creativity. He said, to believe what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men that is genius. Uh, remixed version, to believe what is true for you in your private heart is true for all and then make something about it for all to see, that is art. So again, we're 2014, probably written 2012. Connecting, sharing. So the core piece is connection. And what's ironic is that it's connection that brings contract law into our lives. Because that's how, in a structuralist world, we mediate relationships. And that is no less true in the video game world. It's very much more true. There are contracts between the developer and the gamer, and user license agreements, terms of service. There are contracts between the developer and those who distribute the games. There are contracts between the developers and the people whose tools the developer uses to build the games. There are contracts between the developers and or distributors and ISPs in various ways. And that brings in um, questions of net neutrality and why net neutrality is a big deal to gamers, which we'll get to at certain points. So can I do it yet? And this is sort of the last, the last semi-philosophical thought. I'm not going to do injustice to the very serious thing that this quote was about, but you will never see this quote. It's in the most obscure location. You can't possibly, I don't think you can find it on the net. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. It was on video, an old video, and I heard this. And it was a person of your generation reflecting on some bad things that a previous generation had done. And it was in the context of protest. And he said, we cannot know how we would have acted, but we now know how we should have. And whether you want to apply that principle to environmentalism, whether you want to apply that principle to Trinity Western University's law school, and whether it should proceed or not under its current on its current trajectory. It seems to me that if you look at things from the perspective of where you know they're going, it's easier to come to the right answers today. And video games in terms of intellectual property and contract law is so advanced, and I said this in the first class, that it gives us some pretty good ideas of where we're going. And I guess where I'm suggesting we're going is that Derrida and others are right, and that post-structuralism is correct in terms of our relationship with each other. And I can go well beyond games and point to the internet as kind of exhibit A. 
So if we know where this is going, then shouldn't we make the right decisions today? And is it really so hard to make the right decisions? Um, and that, just in case some of you don't know, um, because this picture has certainly been around, uh, that's the Earth seen from the far side of Saturn. And that's an actual picture. So, not surprisingly, my conclusion, we know what the right thing to do is. Let's do it. Resolve in favor of creativity. How? Well, maybe moral rights. Key, and, and moral rights is a meme, not as a law, but as something that informs us going forward. Has problems. Has some things in it you may not like. Has some things in it I feel a little uncomfortable with. It impliedly endorses we get to this, the right to be forgotten. So how do you feel about the right to be forgotten? And we'll talk about this in a couple of minutes. So Berne Convention, um, what's really interesting about moral rights is that commercial impact is irrelevant. It's not a commercial concept. It's a non-commercial it's about attribution and integrity. If you think about it, it's pretty amazing that in 1886, somebody is really interesting historically to figure out who figured this out, came up with attribution and integrity, which seem to be the two currencies that in the modern digital age make the most sense. And think about this in a structuralist, post-structuralist way. This is not very structuralist. It's got a lot of play in it. Very subjective, very individual. No two situations will be the same. Think of Snow versus Eaton Center. I mean, there, you know, when, when you first hear that case, it's like, are you kidding me? Is this a game? Ducks in the Eaton Center wearing wearing Santa hats, and, they cut, and the court says, no, take them down, take the Santa hats down. It's fantastic stuff. Anyways. And then, sorry the slides get squished. I keep trying to make them small so that that doesn't happen. They, they look totally normal on my laptop. Um, this, I, I picked the, the most artistic tattoo I could find on the open internet where I didn't have to worry about paying royalties to the tattoo artist. Because that's what we need to talk about. Because now you're equipped and you'll come up with whatever your answer is, but I'd like to think you are now equipped to think about The problem that Brian Bertnell of EA talked about, and that is, what if you've got a fighter in your UFC game who's got tattoos that are truly works of art, and you have the fighter's release, but you don't have the tattoo artist? How do you resolve that? Do you resolve that? So it's unclear. Um, the tattoo artist sued THQ. There has been a settlement. There have been some, there's been some legal work done in this area and I've cited an article. The article is really interesting. Yes? I'm just curious, is there any sort of precedent for how these tattoos are dealt with on 
television in terms of property rights and plural rights within each television station? Great question. Um, so the, uh, I can't give you a television example. I can give you a film example. Um, and you can look it up, but the Mike Tyson face tattoo in, what was the film about the four guys in Vegas? First one was good, second one was okay, third one was horrible. Sorry? The Hangover. The Hangover, right. So tattoo artist comes forward, film company settles with them. So what you have is, I think in reality, is if you're a tattoo artist and you've done someone famous and it's prominent. Uh, because remember, there are, de minimis, there are de minimis rules around copyright too. So if it's really a tiny thing, um, it, except in very, you know, there's a little bit of dicta from the United States uh, around remixing a music that there's one case that says it's a bright red line. But generally, um, the prominence of the use, and especially now, um, and especially in Canada where we clearly have users' rights, uh, and fair dealing has become much broader as a result of the Supreme Court of Canada decisions, a minimal use wouldn't do it. So we're talking about major use. Do they have to? Do they have to name wh whose dress or suit you're wearing on the red carpet? What if, you got what if they don't? What if, what if you got plastic surgery done? And you're mm -hmm. beautiful, and you're doing this, and everybody goes, well, can you name your plastic surgeon Susie? And you go, well, actually, you have to give me money because you're beautiful because you're beautiful. Yeah, you, you know, and, and you, you can actually see the digital age dealing with this because you'll be able to scroll over your, your screen and, you know, hair by, uh, you know, facial surgery by, you know, we're, we're clearly getting to that age. I'm actually going to answer your question very directly in one, not more than two slides. Um, but I want to show you kind of the conventional approach. And you kind of go, okay, was this written facetiously or was this written for real? This is a published law journal article. And it says, before getting a tattoo, anyone with a reasonable expectation of fame should arm herself or himself with a, made for, for, with a work made for hire contract, a joint work agreement specifying the customer's contributions and expressing intent to make the customer a joint author or some other written document transferring ownership from the tattooist and the <coughs> tattoo business to the customer. I really like to think that the author was tongue in cheek. When are most tattoos applied? And under what situation is the subject to whom the tattoo is being applied? You know, what, what sort of relative state is their zeitgeist in when they're getting the tattoo applied? They're going to walk in with three agreements? No, I, I'm pretty sure this is tongue in cheek. It doesn't resolve the problem. Sorry. I, I never received a tattoo, but I feel like uh, most of the reputable tattoo shops would probably still do a sign saying that a contract was a piece of No, I, I'm not saying it's inappropriate. I'm saying it's unlikely. <laughs> I'm, I'm perfectly good with appropriate. Um, this, I'd like to think, is the answer to your question and the answer on tattoo. And this is the only precedent I know of that's gone to court. Again, this is, this is a great paper. 
the reproduction right of the tattoo artist is limited to the actual design. So the tattoo artist can take the same tattoo that they apply to me and apply it to you. It's not an exclusive design. I have no right to insist I will be the only one with this tattoo unless I'm going to enter into a contract and I'm going to pay for that as I would with any other artist. It's the artist's right to decide how many in the series of paintings, of tattoos, or otherwise. But the tattoo artist may not interfere with the activities of the person bearing his or her tattoo. Now here's where it gets really interesting and on point for this discussion. The court applied a similar reasoning with respect to the moral rights of the tattoo artist. Right? If, you, if you follow the logic, the tattoo artist, so follow the logic of Snow versus Eaton Center, the tattoo artist could object to Mike Tyson appearing in a film with his face tattoo because you know, he doesn't like Tyson's co-star and doesn't want his work associated. You know, Mel Gibson is Tyson's co-star. I don't want my tattoo in a movie with Mel Gibson. Court said, moral rights are subordinated to the personality rights of the, tattoo, of the tattooed person. I mean, interesting choices. You don't see a lot of cases where this stuff really <laughs> resonates. This court made a choice, personality rights above somebody else's moral rights. Yes. Based on the moral rights of the tattoo artist, you couldn't mod on that tattoo. Exactly. It would be on your body forever. Which is why I think the personality rights issue is correct, because it puts the power in for our purposes. The game or not the game. The player not the structure. But I think there's one more reason, and I think this is code for a deeper reason. Because we talk about personality rights. Well, it's not even code. It's almost there. The design is reproduced on one's body. This is almost this is a physical right. This is a right over your own body. And we have that in other areas of law. And it seems logical that an individual should have. This is, this is not going to strike you as strange as law students that a woman and a man would have rights over their own body and that somebody else wouldn't have a right over your body. So it's pretty logical. I think that's how you traverse this stuff. But if you if you want to follow the metaphor all the way through, you end up with more power in the actual person who's engaging, which is the person with the tattoo or in a video game context, the gamer, not the developer who built the game two years ago and built the structure. Okay. So, we're going to do this moral rights thing. It's an interesting conundrum to resolve. And it's 
got some fascinating political overtones. And that is, and have I mentioned this before? I don't think so. But if I have, I can go through it more quickly. In terms of political alignment, it always struck me as really strange that the privacy literalists and the IP literalists had different views of each other. If you're an IP literalist, you tend to think that privacy is less important. So it's interesting how Hollywood, where you'll find the largest number of IP literalists in many ways, um, very happy to use various rights to tell other people's stories. And they want data on all their consumers and it's not, you know, it's not really, they don't see what the problem is. And likewise, people who are campaigning are very pro-privacy tend to align with more open source stuff. And, and, and tend not to be copyright literalists. And when you think about this problem, there is a common denominator. And the common denominator is that both sides feel that the ones and zeros belong to me. So, where is that? You want to look at it in a moral rights context. And you apply, broadly speaking, the notion of moral rights. Those ones and zeros are mine in terms of attribution and integrity. That gets you really close to the right to be forgotten in a privacy context. I find myself uncomfortable with that because I'm not a big fan of the right to be forgotten. But if I am a fan of moral rights, it seems to take us there. And of course, we're, and this is a very live issue. European Court of Justice has ruled that Google has to respect the right to be forgotten, entrenched in, in European law, giving you a site um, Again, great papers here. And, and here's the actual decision. It's not, the right to be forgotten is not an absolute right. It's, it's I won't say it's post-structuralist, but it's got, it's got enough elements of play in it. It's got enough flexibility in it that it applies to every individual situation. Um, another concept and Dave Spratley is going to come and talk to us about trademark law. Um, it was use it or lose it, which is a very uh, interesting part of trademark law, uh, which I used to really endorse highly. Um, and that's the notion that if someone isn't actively commercially using their trademark, they lose their trademark. And if you think about that in terms of patent law or copyright law, it essentially eliminates trolling. But, and this is what the Trademarks Act used to say, but we are amending or have amended the Trademarks Act. I think it just came into force to say that use is no longer a factor in Canada. So. Now we arrive at the fly in the ointment. And that is, guess what? I've warned you of this. 
everything that we've talked about thus far in the course is fairy tale land. Because we can wax poetic and philosophical about what copyright law should and shouldn't be. But contract law supersedes it. And so the reality is that when you are on an app on your computer, you are not being governed by the Copyright Act, you're being governed by the contract between two. We are already in a post-IP world. And, you know, examples, you know, Facebook's experiment on everybody. The question becomes, What do people know from the terms of use and from the end user license agreement? Was there enough disclosure or was it? So right, we're learning. Go right to the contract. Positive aspects of this in a gaming context. End user license agreements are used by developers when toxic things happen in their community. Now, would there be other remedies? We'll talk about that in due course. Ooh. So, is IP law getting swept away by privity of contract, um, privacy agreements, other kinds of, of law and regulation? Question for you to think about. And I know nobody buys a CD anymore. But back when you did buy CDs, when you were in elementary school, why was there no end user license agreement? You never had to agree to anything. There was no contract in the CD. There is on iTunes. Um, the one point here that's, that's, that's worth noting, and I, I mentioned it um, a couple of weeks ago. And that is that for years, and this was pre-multiplayer, EA didn't have contractual terms on its games. They treated their games like a, like a music CD you bought, and they were quite content. And I talked to their general counsel at the time, and they were like, copyright law is good for us. We're fine with it. We don't have to add additional burdens to consumers. That really did change when multiplayer came in. So there's a whole bunch of factors. The infinite sliceability and diceability of IP. The fact that IP itself is post-structuralist, at least in that way, makes it very contract friendly. I can give you the rights to use a copyright every second Tuesday of the month in Belgium during the year 2016. And I can give everybody else every other little piece of those rights as long as they add up to 1.000. Well, actually, they don't have to add up to 1.0. They can add up to whatever they add up to as long as they don't add up to more than 1.000. And as long as they don't overlap onto each other. Um, the problems, and we will talk about this, um, at length over the next couple of weeks is um, no one really contracts out of this stuff. We're the 99% of 
they don't negotiate with us, which is particularly fascinating because they're very, very happy to, be, to address ads to us extremely personally, but they won't do contracts with us equally personally. So don't tell me they can do, they have the capability of doing one but not the other. The technological competence is the same. Um, this is a 2008 <coughs> academic paper. Uh, to read all of the privacy policies you encounter, you need to take a month off of work every year. So they, the, 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 this, was, this was done academically, average reading of a uh, level of a second year university student working 10 hour days, one hour off for lunch, if you read every privacy policy in 2000A, didn't include end user license agreements. I did a back of the envelope calculation and I come to it would be about seven months a year for us today, if you actually read these things. And then, you know, click graphs have been upheld. Uh, Average rate of readership of EULAs is on the order of 0.1% to 1%. Lots of legal academic work on the vanishing rights that come with boilerplate. So we're alive to the issue. Of course, they're not really dealing with it. Where it becomes important is you know, where there are rejections of things you might not like, all of these things are done by contract. And so now we're just going to do quick issues because we're going to talk about them all. Digital reset. Case called Redigi. I can sell you my CD. Can I sell you my digital data that I've paid the same amount for that I own? I can, I can sell you my CD. I can't sell you my iTunes Music. Very clever system that allowed for this and ensured that there were no duplicate copies. Um, uh, making its way through the courts. Kitchen sink. This is, this is our bad as lawyers. We throw everything at the kitchen. If you're drafting a contract, and you will do this too. This, this, this talk will not prevent you from doing it. You will only feel safe if you've looked at everybody else's precedent and added every single clause they have and maybe come up with a few of your own. So we get this, it's, uh, um, what's, what's it called, code creep, or, you know, where code just expands endlessly. We've got that. What happens on death to your digital products? Can you, tra I, can, I can take my bookshelves and I can transfer them. My kids will get them. My wife will get them. What happens to my, do they have to log in as me forever? Now, you know, people are thinking about this. Some companies are solving it. Uh, Non-circumvention, digital locks, we'll deal with that separately. And of course, there's a backlash to all of this. Um, and I would say a healthy one. Uh, but these end up also becoming contracts. And, I, you know, I need to highlight this a bit more. I think consumer protection laws in this area are really the answer. We need to address these issues directly. And sadly, we have to address them in the structuralist way that we know how. And next week, we're actually going to read these contracts and go through the cases around them purely in a video game context. Almost all of the, of, of the 10 cases that we're going to talk about, I think nine of them are video game law cases. So 
So we're in the belly of the beast. So we're going to take five minutes, switch over to Dave Spratley's materials, and go from there. It really is my great pleasure uh, to introduce Dave Spratley, um, who I've had the privilege of working <laughs> with in the distant past, um, and who is a truly great lawyer. Uh, he is at Davison Company, um, and uh, he is a first-time speaker uh, in this class. Uh, and he is going to talk about trademarks and video games. He did a fair bit of work on the first edition of Video Game Law uh, and did some, some great stuff um, when I was working on the book. And so uh, he's, he's taking on a topic that is new to this course. We've talked about trademarks inferentially in the past, and this is one of... Dave's areas, mm -hmm. and so he's agreed uh, to look at it with more depth. So uh, I'm very appreciative uh, of that and uh, very appreciative of, of Dave because he always does a great job. Sounds good. Hey, everyone. Trademarks and video games, that's uh, the very exciting title of my presentation. I couldn't come up with anything else. But uh, here's what we're going to do. Uh, I don't know if any of you know much about trademarks, so I'm just going to run through some basics for you. And then ju jump right into trademarks and video games. Uh, I've kind of broken it down into tr what I call traditional issues and then non-traditional issues. And then I'll do a recap at the end to kind of highlight what we talked about. If you have questions, jump in. I've told John he can jump in. So let's really have a chat rather than a, a presentation if that works. So trademark basics. What is a trademark? Here we go. <clears throat> I'm citing legislation right from the top. Uh, trademarks Act says that a mark Trademark is a mark that is used by a person for the purpose of distinguishing uh, where is the services manufactured, sold, leased, hired, or performed by him from those manufactured, sold, leased, hired, or performed by others. So did you get all that? What is a trademark? A trademark is an indicator of source. If you see something branded with a trademark and you see something else branded with the same mark, uh, you know that they come from the same source and uh, they distinguish products and services of one business from those of another. And built into a trademark is this whole idea of reputation and goodwill, right? We, uh, we see a brand and we associate certain things with it, and that's why if we see something else with that brand, we say, oh, you know what, I like Nike shoes, I'm sure this Nike shirt is gonna be awesome. Right? It's that kind of thing. Well, a trademark can be a word, it can be a logo, a design, or it can be a combination of both. Uh, you get a trademark, and I'll talk about this a bit more, by uh, uh, registering it. So a trademark has to be registrable, and each, uh, each country has its own rules. In Canada, it has to be a few things. It has to be, uh, can't be descriptive, uh, can't be offensive, uh, can't be confusing with an existing mark. Uh, right now in Canada, you have to have used a mark uh, in Canada to be able to register it. That's about to change. There's some pretty massive uh, trademark amendments underway that were totally buried in an omnibus bill. I don't know if you've heard about that, but anyhow, that's underway. So uh, keep your eyes open for a whole new trademark regime in Canada. Where, what is the status of that? Because I alluded to the elimination of use. When, and, and, you know, I always talk about the virtues of use it or lose it in a trademark context, and now I find that I have to actually drop that. Um, but when do we expect this change to happen, and could it still not happen? I, d I don't think it will not happen. Uh, it caught a lot of people by surprise, and uh, the IP bar across Canada and the trademarks bar, they're in discussions right now with Industry Canada um, about the regulations and how this is all going to play out, so I don't really have a time frame. Uh, but it's, it's underway, and it's a big, it's a big change um, away from, from requiring use in Canada to not. So... Um, not that you really care at this point, but John, even if you <coughs> register a mark under the new regime, uh, it can still be challenged on the basis of non-use, so the use it or lose it still will apply. It's just for the, for the purposes of registering. Okay, so I can, I can go can, back to my old slides. You can still say that, yes. All right, wholesale change on the way. And uh, trademark rights are national. So if you register a trademark in Canada, you have rights in Canada. Uh, you can't enforce it in the U.S. unless you've registered it there. Now, each trademark um, is registered in association with specific products and or services. And the uh, protection you get from registering that trademark extends 
to those products and services, the ones you've listed, <coughs> and then kind of beyond it. And that beyond question is a, it's a gray area. Trademarks law is full of gray areas because <coughs> you spend all this time writing a trademark application and listing products and services and describing them how the trademarks office wants them described. <coughs> and then you get your registration. Uh, but then you're able to enforce it against anyone who's using it for those specific things or things that are kind of similar to them. And then you have a big fight about whether they're similar enough to be confusing. And I say at the end there, fame complicates everything. Uh, don't I know it? But uh, uh, famous marks have, have broader protection sometimes. And it's a little different in Canada and the US. Um, <coughs> but there were cases a while ago. Uh, sorry, so if you have a famous mark, it can extend beyond kind of the products and services it's registered with. Um, some earlier cases said, for example, that someone had, was using Lexus in association with canned fruit. And uh, the Lexus car people went after them. And the court said, no, that's fine. Um, no one's going to think that the canned fruit comes from you. Uh, things are a little different now. I was so disappointed when the publisher of our book, because you were part of the first mm -hmm. one as well, didn't send us a car because it's Lexus, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, I quoted from the act again, just to swamp you with words. Um, use is a is a key issue, and we talked about it um, in terms of registration. But what count use factors into still registering here and uh, in conflicts in trademark disputes, whether there's infringement or not, whether there's confusion, and the act actually defines what it means to use a trademark. So it says a trademark is deemed to be used with wares or products. If uh, at the time property or possession of the products is transferred in the normal course of trade, the mark is on the products themselves or on their packaging or is otherwise associated with them in some obvious way. Uh, it's different for uh, services. If you have a service mark, is what they call it in the US, trademark that covers services, um, you use the mark, quote unquote, use it, uh, if you use or display it in the performance or advertising of those services. And I, wanna, I want you to keep that kind of in the back of your head uh, because that this whole issue about use factors largely into some of the discussions we're going to have. Trademark is, is the Davis LLP mark a service mark? Yes. I believe it is registered. I, some of that, that would be extraordinary. So, <laughs> some of that might be sitting on my desk right now. Um, infringement. So unauthorized use of a trademark. Uh, the issue is it leads to consumer confusion and unfair competition. Uh, the, the real basis of the claim is that you're free writing on someone else's reputation, right? I use a, instead of Prada, I use my Prada U shirt. People say, see it, they think, oh my goodness, that's Prada, I'm gonna buy it for five bucks in Hong Kong. Um, I'm free writing on Prada's reputation. Uh, th there's, so that's kind of what everyone thinks of as infringement. There's also this issue of dilution, what they call it in the US and Canada has something equivalent called depreciation of goodwill. If someone does something that affects the value of your mark, affects the goodwill associated with it, it may not necessarily be an exact infringement, but they're using it or doing something with it that really affects your brand, then you also have a remedy for that. So again, your registered trademark uh, gives you the right to prevent the use of an identical or confusingly similar mark. And um, identical is pretty straightforward. Confusingly similar, though, is that gray area I spoke about before. Again, the, the act goes into detail about what counts as confusion. Uh, but you have to look at a bunch of factors. You have to look at whether the mark, how similar the mark is to your mark, whether it's being used with similar products or services, whether it's being used in a similar channel of trade or type of business, uh, and things like that. So there's a whole bunch of factors that go into whether there's confusion in any given case. And that's where our trademark lawyers spend all their time uh, fighting over things. Can I ask one question? Um that I think is pretty relevant to, to video games. But if you're gonna deal with it later, just tell me to, tell me to hold it. Um, copyright law in Canada has finally adopted parody as a defense. How does parody fit in to trademarks? And given that games often use other people's marks in a parody context, um, how, how does that get dealt with, or will you be dealing with it specifically? I, I kind of touch on it. I mean, at its base, it really boils down to the use question. I mean, if you're doing something with a mark, but you're not using it, 
then really you're good to go. So that's the question that we're going to keep coming back to during the presentation. The U.S. also has this concept of, of they call it nominative fair use for trademarks, where you can, the US, in the U.S., they say you can use a trademark to refer to the thing it's registered with without infringing. And so I think one of the first cases on that point was someone, I think, had a Backstreet Boys contest or survey or something, and they got sued by the Backstreet Boys, and the court said, well, there's no way to refer to the Backstreet Boys without calling them the Backstreet Boys. So there we go. Well, and, and what's interesting, if you look at the Supreme Court of Canada's pentology around copyright and you start extrapolating those principles into trademark, I assume that hasn't happened yet. But sooner or later, a trademark case will make it to the Supreme Court of Canada. And it'll be very interesting to see how users' rights might play into trademark. That's right. Uh, so infringement depends on use and confusion, all kind of defined in the act. And here's a, an important point to remember is kind of unchecked infringement can invalidate your trademark. And so the reason for that is because, like I said, a trademark is an indicator of source. If there are multiple trademarks that are confusing with each other in the marketplace, all of a sudden they're not distinctive of one particular source. They're they refer to multiple sources. Consumers don't associate, associate them with one source. And then neither brand is particularly enforceable against the other. And that's why, I mean, you often see in the news uh, these kind of sad stories about little businesses that get nasty demand letters from massive corporations. And sure, it is kind of nasty to send a cease and desist letter, but there's a real reason for doing it, and that is to protect your brand and keep it distinctive. And there's a whole kind of PR side to all that. I don't know if anyone here remembers the, the Haida Bucks issue a bunch of years ago with some coffee shop on the island, I think, was calling itself Haida Bucks. And they got a demand letter from Starbucks. <coughs> um, and Starbucks, you know, again, I appreciate what they were doing. I know why they did it. I've sent letters like that, too. Um, but there was kind of a massive PR outcry, and Starbucks kind of backed off. But again, I know why they did it. Uh, copyright. Here's something uh, to keep in mind as well. So really, I'm just talking about trademarks today. But a trademark can be a logo, and a logo can be a trademark. It can also be a, a creative work that's protected by copyright. So that raises a different set of issues, but it's something to keep in mind, and it's going to come up again later, is we're talking about trademarks and trademark rights, but uh, even if you're not using a logo, say, as a trademark, so that you're not infringing trademark rights, you might still be infringing copyright. So keep, keep that in mind, too. Protecting a trademark, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, typically, you do some clearance searches to see if it's registered uh, in the jurisdiction where you want protection, uh, see what's out there in terms of marks that might be confusing with it, or see whether the space is open. Uh, you file your application, you get objections from the trademarks office, you deal with those. Third parties have the ability to oppose your application. An opposition is kind of like a little, it's a mini litigation. There's pleadings and evidence and written and oral arguments. And if you get through all that, if there are no objections or you deal with them, or there's an opposition and you deal with it, then eventually it gets registered. You can have unregistered trademark rights. If you've heard of passing off, it's a tort. It's also, uh, uh, there's also a statutory passing off under the Trademarks Act. So you can have an unregistered mark, and you acquire rights in it merely by using it with your business. Uh, but those rights are limited to the jurisdictions or the geographical locations where you can prove that you've developed a reputation. So the benefit to registering a trademark in Canada is that then you get trademark protection across Canada, regardless of where you actually use your mark. So trademarks and video games. Let's get into the fun stuff. Trademarks come up all over the place in video games. Video game suppliers have them. Video games themselves have them. Sometimes they're in video games, and that's a really fun stuff. So we'll get to that. Um, but let's is that talk Crazy Taxi. Uh, you know what? Or I've, Simpsons. I, I, you know what? I've forgotten what that is actually. Okay. I've forgotten what that is. Um, I must admit it. Is it? Yeah. Haven't played a video game since my son was born four years ago, so I'm kind of out of touch. Uh, let's talk about what I call the traditional trademark issues. So here is a good example. November 2001, this thing called the Xbox happened. Uh, right? Microsoft launched its console. 
Um, but what happened before that was interesting because it's a little hard to read here, but there was this company called Xbox Technologies, which did computer stuff. And they had some trademark applications or maybe even registrations, I can't remember. Uh, and Microsoft announced its launch. It said, this year's what we're going to do. We're going to have this awesome thing. It's going to be called the Xbox. And all of a sudden, this popped up, and they had a big dispute. Uh, not surprisingly, Xbox came out on top. I think the party settled. Xbox Technologies removed their marks and probably got paid a lot of money, and now we have the Xbox. Here is another example. Dark Age of Camelot is, uh, is or was a very popular online mm -hmm. multiplayer game. Um, uh, provided by Mythic, Mythic Entertainment. There's Mythic's mark. Um, Microsoft, they come up a lot, don't they? Uh, came out and announced that they were going to produce their own online game called Mythica. Uh, again, big dispute, big fight, lots of words exchanged. Uh, at one point, and this is my favorite part, um, someone high up from Mythic Entertainment said that they were going to call their next game Microsofta. <laughs> Uh, Scrabble versus uh, Scramble with Friends, uh, another word game. I think that's, I can't remember who provides it. Uh, but again, a trademark dispute. Uh, this one was in the UK, I believe. And uh, the Scrabble people, I can't remember who owns the Scrabble rights in Europe versus North America. I think it's different. Uh, but anyhow, they sued. Uh, and the court said, I think this might have been an injunction, but the court said, well, you know what? Scramble and Scrabble are different enough words, so we're not concerned there, no problem um, with having your scramble trademark, but we think that specific design uh, is confusing because the M in kind of that weird configuration looks a bit like a B, so that's confusing. So you can't register your, or you can't register or use your, your design there, but you can call your game scramble. Oh, and here's, a, here's another one. So Bethesda, The Elder Scrolls, a video game. Uh, Mojang, you've heard about them. They're $2.5 billion to the good right now. Um, they announced that they were going to produce a game called Scrolls. And again, dispute, lawsuit, I believe, uh, eventually settled. The Mojang Scrolls game certainly exists now. I think the part of the settlement was that Mojang would not actually register the, the trademark, but they could use it with their game. So these are all what I call kind of traditional trademark issues. Right, really, these are, these are businesses that are using marks for their products or services. All the standard questions come up. Are the marks too similar? Would their use cause confusion? Um, as I've said, there's nothing really video gamey about it. Right? These are the same as trademark disputes you have in any, in any industry. So sure, it's video game related, but it's not really, there's no special video game twist to it. So let's go to the not-so-traditional uh, video game trademark issues, and these are really the fun ones. Frosty Treats, right? Big company, they sell uh, Frosty Treats. They sell ice cream. And they're little ice cream vans with the clowns on, on the side. Then this happened. Um, I've forgotten which game this is, and it was, it's in the... It's quite an old game. I don't know if it's still around, but... Um, Carmageddon or something like that, anyhow. So you'll see there's a little van here. Ice cream van has a clown on the side blowing up other cars. Frosty Treats is not impressed. They bring a lawsuit. Uh, and the court says, no, that's fine. First of all, the, you know, they're not doing anything confusing. No one's going to think that this crazy ice cream van is in any way associated with Frosty Treats. Um, but it's an interesting issue. Here's another one, Grand Theft Auto, one of the older versions of it, had a, had a virtual uh, strip club, I believe, called the, pig, the pig Pen. There was an actual real-life gentleman's club called the Play Pen. And, uh, and they objected to the use of this in-game in business called the Pig Pen. Again, uh, didn't really get anywhere, the court said, not confusing. It's no one's going to think that you're associated with it. It's a non-issue. Great decision, though. I mean, it, it's really neat because there's an actual decision, mm -hmm. kind of well worth reading that parses through the issue in 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 a 
slightly tongue-in-cheek way. Well, as John said, if you're if you're basing your claim on trademarks, there's no real acknowledged kind of parody exception for trademark use, or for, there's no kind of there's no equivalent to fair dealing or fair use really for trademarks in the same way there is in copyright. Uh, and, and there's a whole series. Just if you line up the Copyright Act and copyright law and trademark law, there's a whole bunch of stuff missing in trademark law. You know, there's no sort of journalistic mm -hmm. editorial privilege per se and you know so we're we're missing all of that fair dealing stuff. That's right. So um, and it, it, some of it gets implied and brought in by smart judges around the edges, but it's not directly dealt with. Again, a great paper for the course, but mm -hmm. So at their base, I mean, trademark and copyright law are, are dealing with different things, obviously. Yeah. So, so copyright certainly certainly involves users in a way that trademark law doesn't necessarily involve users. So, I think that's one of the issues that that pops up here. Um, what was I saying? So, sure, if you're if you're portraying a brand in a video game, what are you doing? It, it could be product placement. Some companies definitely do that. They pay to have their brands in a video game the same way they pay to have them in a movie or a TV show. Um, Barack Obama, I think in his first campaign, his campaign ads were popping up all, the, all over the place on online games. Um, I can't remember which, there was a car, one of the car games, right? There was, you would drive by a billboard that had a Barack Obama ad on it. Um, some of the sports game had billboards with his stuff as well. But if it's not product placement, if, if the brand owner hasn't, paid or done something to have the brand there, then then what are we dealing with? Is it an infringement? I mean, it might give the impression that the brand owner endorses or is affiliated with the game. But games are, you know, they're meant to be immersive. They're meant to be realistic. Um, it's a more interesting gaming experience if you're, if you're involved in a game or playing a game that takes place on Earth, you know, in our world to see things that you would see in your everyday life. So there's a reason to include stuff like that to make it as real as possible without necessarily getting permission. So is merely displaying a brand use, right? Because again, infringement relies on there being use of a trademark. Well, what can we learn from the movies? We can turn to uh, George of the Jungle 2, which I've never seen. Apparently, so I'm told through this case, that the villains in this movie used Caterpillar bulldozers to do nefarious things. Caterpillar sued. Um, its temporary injunction application was dismissed. Uh, the court said, well, your infringement claim is not likely to succeed. Uh, there was no indication that Disney had used the Caterpillar brand or products to free ride on the marks on their reputation or goodwill. Um, they weren't trying to drive sales or consumer awareness of the movie. It wasn't that Disney was thinking that a whole bunch of Caterpillar I don't know, bulldozer owners were going to rush out and see George of the Jungle 2. Court also said that the, the dilution claim was not likely to succeed. Uh, nothing in the movie suggested that the, the Caterpillar products were shoddy or were cast in a poor light. Judge pointed out that the movie was fictional, had fantastical elements, and the Caterpillar products were merely inanimate implements of the villain's nefarious schemes. I'm sure that's a direct quote. Uh, and we're not directly responsible for any unsavory activity. And you know, when you think about it, that makes good sense. It gets back to what I was saying. You know, what um, if you're if you're filming a movie and you happen to pick up a brand, uh, probably not doing anything wrong. So why not the same thing in a in a video game? That's what I would say. Can, can I just stop you there because, sure. and you weren't here for when we were talking about it, but you said something really intriguing and I'm going to go down the, the, the legal rabbit hole with the class and you. You said, don't forget that when you've got a trademark, you often also have a copyright in a particular piece of artwork. Okay. So now let's follow through on the Caterpillar example and imagine this is a Canadian lawsuit where we've got moral rights at stake. And under copyright, 
Caterpillar, now magically a Canadian company, suing a Canadian film producer in Canada, says, we don't want our Caterpillar artwork. You know, we've got this really beautiful and very original black triangle, and it's, uh, it's uh, we, we don't want it besmirched mm-hmm. by having it be an object of destruction because we believe in pacifism and building, and that's what our brand is all about. And so we're asserting a moral rights cr- claim. There is a way to mm-hmm. get there in Canada that wouldn't exist in the States. Well, that's an interesting point. So two things there. One is that moral rights society, if we're talking about copyright, Canadian Copyright Act has an incidental inclusion clause. So it's not infringement of copyright if you are doing something, taking a picture, making a movie, and you happen to reproduce a copyrighted work, but it's not really the focus of what you're doing. So I can take a picture. It's not a good example here, but say there was a UBC brand on the wall. I could take a picture of you guys. It would capture the UBC brand, or the UBC design, the logo, but I wouldn't be infringing copyright because I wasn't. Right, wasn't but, but somehow so, the, the, the sure. film director decided that the money shot was of the Caterpillar logo before all the destruction right. Right. happened. Of course. Well, you know what? Then there would be an interesting argument. On the moral rights side, kind of interesting because moral rights are with the, the author, not necessarily the owner. So presumably the, the person who designed the logo has waived... <laughs> If they were Canadian, they would have waived their moral rights in favor of the company. Exactly. No, so, but you become very, yes. co- you know, if this was an exam course, it would be the owner of of of, uh, right. ca- of Caterpillar who designed the logo. He's still around. He owns the moral rights in the work, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But, but it's very, it's a very interesting thing because we've been focusing a lot on moral rights. So I'm bringing this okay. up almost about the other 80% of the course, if you will, to think about and contrast how moral rights might work in a trademark context and whether you think that's good or not good. Does it help or doesn't it help in terms of user rights and other things and modders rights? You know, I was in uh, Toronto last year and I had never done this before, but I had some time to kill. So I went to Eaton Center um, to make my pilgrimage to the, to the, the birthplace of Canadian moral rights case law. That's kind of how much of an IP nerd I am, I suppose. Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, well, the overlap between trademark and copyright comes up in a bunch of other places too, including in, uh, in the whole gray market, gray market import right. area. So there's some very confusing case law from the Supreme Court um, where, where people are trying to rely on, rather than trademark law, on copyright law in packaging to prevent gray market imports and sales in Canada. So... It's an interesting dichotomy that comes up in a bunch of places. Uh, So uh, George of the Jungle 2 court also says, it's a common phenomenon for branded products to appear in movies and television shows. And that what happened in that movie was probably not trademark infringement or unfair competition. Um, And you may think about this. You look at a lot of TV shows, especially reality shows, and, and people will be wearing clothes with things blurred out and whatnot. There's certainly... I mean, I'm not here to talk about copyright clearance. I'm here to talk about trademarks. But there's certainly a paranoia on the copyright side that I think television people especially err on the side of caution is that they they will just blur out logos and things like that when they're not sure um, if there's an exception that might, might apply to them because people will sue you, especially in the U.S. So they err on the side of caution. I think often uh, copyright clearance is, uh, at least in Canada, is kind of over the top because, again, there's the incidental inclusion, exception, things like that. You don't have to be uber paranoid about every design or piece of art or what have you that appears in your work, but people are anyways. All right, another, uh, another stellar movie here. Again, I have not seen this. Dickie Roberts, former child star. <coughs> uh, David Spade's character in the movie injures himself by improperly using a slip and slide. Whammo sues for trademark infringement and uh, dilution. Again, the temporary injunction application is dismissed um, for all the same reasons we talked about. Anyone watching would understand that the character was using the slip and slide improperly <coughs> and would not think less of the brand because of it. And the trademark formed part of the movie's jumble of imagery, uh, but was not highlighted so as to exploit the mark's value. So, yep. uh, the selling. 
I mean, that's that's where you make your money, right? If you're a plaintiff, it's you try to um, the movie's ready to go, and the movie companies want it out there. So if you can stop them at that point, then. Uh, who knows? The, it might be money. It might be. It might be really getting the brand out of it. Uh, so here, let's talk about this next example. Uh, on TV, heroes. Uh, I think in one of the first episodes, one of the main characters injures her, perhaps hand. I think she was a cheerleader. Injures her hand in a garburetor or the incinerator. Emerson Electric sues NBC for trademark infringement and dilution. This is sounding familiar, isn't it? Um, they say that the show cast the garbage just unit in an unsavory light uh, and had therefore irreparably tarnished the product. So, so that one actually, uh, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Do you want me to tip? No, I'm good. Okay, okay. so uh, that one didn't go to court or anything. I think they settled. I think NBC said, well, we think that your claim is bunk, but uh, just for the sake of moving forward, we're going to we're going to blur out the Insecurator brand from that scene. And if it ever appears again, we'll blur it out there too. So I don't know if it's, uh, uh, it's an odd example. Um, apparently, I don't know if this is true or not, that if you stick your hand down a garburetor, it won't actually do a great deal of damage. I don't know if that's true. I'm not going to try it. But um, again. <laughs> Thanks for that help. <laughs> <laughs> but even for the... Uh, uh, the, the previous example, I mean, if someone is doing something obviously wrong or misusing a product, then how can it be a, how can it affect the brand to display that? But again, brand owners aren't always rational. So what do we learn here from movies and TV? So displaying, a, merely displaying a mark in your TV show, in your movie, in your video game is probably not use. Not use of a trademark is defined in the Trademarks Act. And therefore, it's probably not any kind of infringement. Because if you're displaying the brand, if it appears in the game or appears in your movie, you're not doing it to free ride on the reputation of the brand owner. I mentioned uh, nominative fair use in the US, how you can use a trademark to, descri to describe a product. I said that Canada doesn't really have that same concept, but I think it just boils down to, again, what counts as use and what doesn't. And kind of the universal truth is that people will still sue you um, at least in the US. So I think the takeaway about displaying trademarks in video games is that it's probably not infringement. Uh, there's a whole copyright issue we've discussed um, for logos. Uh, but there's still risk in it because especially the big brand owners will uh, will litigate when they when they feel it's required. Is the reason does freedom of expression ever come into the reasoning here or is it simply sort of de minimis yeah that's a fair question I, i'm not aware if it does i don't know that it has so where, where this gets interesting um i, I guess uh, is in the context of mods so mm -hmm. my favorite old game as the class knows and you probably remember is grand prix legends mm -hmm. when grand prix legends came out in the 19 with the 1967 formula one season they made up names. The developer, instead of having Honda, had Murasama. Uh, they, they made up names for the cars. The modding community then went and built the proper cars and called the Honda the Honda and called the Ferrari the Ferrari um, and the Lotus the Lotus and the Brabham the Brabham. So uh, it, the, from what you're saying, the modding community actually legitimately could get away with that. Or at least there's I, a chance. I, I there's think, a, there's, there's an argument chance. kind of yep. that it's on this kind of de minimis. Sure. Uh, it, because no action was ever taken. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we do have an action that was settled, uh, which I'll talk about in another context, where EA was sued by uh, helicopter company for including a helicopter in Call of Duty. I don't know if you're going to talk about that one. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that really, but now that you brought it up, I totally will. Um, because there's this whole other level of stuff. I mean, we're talking, I'm here to talk about trademarks and video games, and I mentioned how, you know, including a real world trademark or brand in your game adds kind of that whole level of reality to it. So, of course, a lot of video games 
do other things to add reality. They're set in real life locations. They use real life vehicles or, or weapons. Well, like Call of Duty or games like that are full of real world weapons with all the specs there. Um, and it's a really fascinating question about what IP rights does that engage? So even aside from trademarks, right, there was a issue with, oh, it comes up all the time, uh, the fall of, what was the Sony shooter, the fall of man or something? Um, anyhow, there was a, one level was set, right, Alien Debate Earth, big fight. Um, one level was set in the Manchester Cathedral. And the Manchester Cathedral objected um, quite vehemently about that. But it's not clear what rights they would have relied on to, to prevent that from happening. Just recently here in Vancouver, right, the whole Main Street massacre, did you guys know, hear about that? You know, the, the, the SkyTrain shut down recently, and some, some annoyed developer who was stuck on the SkyTrain for hours went away and built a little shooter game called Main Street Massacre that takes place at Main Street SkyTrain Station. And TransLink came out, and they were upset, and they demanded that he take it down and that they were going to enforce their IP rights to the full extent of the law, blah, blah, blah. But again, I challenge them to actually tell me what IP rights they're relying on there to... to well, in that. involving this class, uh, a couple of years ago, a mod came out for a shooter that was of a Vancouver high school. Yeah. And one of the students in this class went to that high school and wrote an interesting post, which you'll find... Uh, on the site about just how strange that feels, but there probably weren't any legal objections to be had. What else? Oh, and can I just do one footnote? Yes. Because it, it, it's in a slightly different context, but it's extremely important. When, um, when there, uh, I, I'm trying to remember which horrible shooting accident, not accident, a series of murders in the United States occurred, uh, but what emerged when, um, uh, when uh, the, what's the American Gun Association called? The NRA. The NRA. So when the NRA was doing its thing, sort of blaming video games would emerge was how much some of the video game companies were paying the gun, the gun manufacturers for the rights to use the weaponry in the games. 